Tonight, is there no end in sight? Another jumbo interest rate hike from the Fed. The Federal Reserve raising rates by three quarters of a point. The fourth straight time it has taken such an aggressive action. The move an urgent push to curb soaring inflation. What it all means for your credit card bills, car payments, and mortgages. Also tonight, the looming holiday travel strike. 15,000 pilots voting to authorize a frontline picket as we head into the busiest travel season of the year. The major airlines that could be affected and the likelihood a deal will be reached before Thanksgiving. Suburban swing, the new poll just out with six days to go until the midterms. White suburban women abandoning the Democratic Party in favor of Republicans. Could this critical voting bloc tip the scales on Election Day? A daughter's 911 plea, the terrifying moments at a McDonald's in New Orleans. Employees held up at gunpoint, forced to hide in a freezer. One teen calling for help. The 911 operator on the other end of the line, her mother, how she helped save the day. Plus, productivity plunge, new data showing the biggest drop in employee output in decades. What experts say is driving this trend. And finding JoJo. A six-year-old vanishing after a custody visit with his father. The pair seen on surveillance video, then spotted in Canada. The anonymous tip that helped bring him home. And the powerful moment he ended up back in his mother's arms. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. We don't have to tell you, inflation is still out of control. The Federal Reserve now using the only weapon in its arsenal, raising interest rates by three quarters of a percentage point yet again. It's the fourth straight rate hike of this magnitude and the sixth total of the year. You can see here the increase is getting more and more aggressive as the year has gone on and inflation still remains high. So Wall Street reacting positively at first to today's announcement, believing this would be the last 0.75 hike. But as Fed Chair Jerome Powell began speaking at an afternoon press conference, a bleaker reality settling in. Powell admitting, quote, a rate hike would be premature and that we have a long way to go with that news. The Dow shedding 500 points by market close. You can see that moment right here. And as the interest rates climb, credit card debt. Take a look at this graphic soaring. Right alongside it, this chart illustrating the staggering rate at which Americans are taking on debt. Collectively, we're talking about credit cards here. Credit card holders owning $926 billion. And the latest hike will only push that data point even further. But will this short-term pain mean an end to inflation down the road? Tom Costello leads us off tonight. Just minutes after announcing the sixth rate hike this year, Federal Reserve Chairman Powell in the spotlight. It will take some time for inflation to come down. It'll take time, we think. The top question, could the Fed slow the pace of rate hikes in December? The answer, a rate hike pause is premature. We think we have a ways to go. We have some ground to cover with interest rates. Powell says inflation is not coming down and it's better to raise rates too quickly than allow inflation to become entrenched. Powell has to thread a very, very narrow needle. Nearly a dozen Democratic lawmakers, including Senator Elizabeth Warren, have written to Powell about the alarming pace of rate hikes and the disregard for the livelihoods of millions of working Americans. In San Diego, high school teacher Whitney Chase and her family would like to buy a house. But with home prices high and mortgage rates doubling to 7%, they're staying in a rental for now. Well, the higher interest rates at this point, I mean, have just kind of made it impossible. It's not even worth looking into at this point. In Chicago, a week after Dolores Mason bought a new car, she was laid off. Our credit cards are in shambles. And then as soon as we pay it down, we put stuff back on it. Credit card rates now averaging 19%, the highest in decades, just as Americans start holiday shopping. I feel like the economy does not want me to live my best life. The challenge, despite inflation, unemployment remains near 50-year lows with nearly two job openings for every potential worker. It's the first time we have high-paying jobs and not enough people to do them. <laughs> nice thing, isn't it? It's a nice problem to have. Meanwhile, we're expecting another critical update on jobs on Friday. And in addition, we may already have a preview. The private payroll numbers came out today, showing companies added 239,000 jobs in October, mostly in leisure and hospitality. That's far more than expected. Also, wages rose 7.7%. So those higher wages and then those job openings with not enough employees, that just fuels the inflation cycle. That's a big challenge for the Fed. Tom? Okay, Tom Costello, Tom, we appreciate it.
As Tom mentioned, with the Fed hiking interest rates again today, that made borrowing money even more expensive. And that news could spell trouble for millions of Americans with credit card debt. I want to bring in Farnoosh Torabi. She's the editor-at-large at CNET Money. Farnoosh, I want to pull up that number that we mentioned at the top there, data from the St. Louis Federal Reserve. It shows Americans owe $926 billion in credit card and other revolving debt. But you look at that graph and you can see that dramatic rise there as we go from 2021 to now 2022. What do you think are the main drivers in credit card debt? Is, is it all inflation, or do you think the American consumer has gotten to this point after the pandemic where it's just credit and forget it? Well, inflation certainly is part of the narrative here. And as you saw in that chart, the last year, as inflation has been ballooning, more people are becoming dependent on credit. But look, United States is a credit nation. Uh, this is not a new story. This is something that has been accumulating for decades. And when you look at wages, now Tom uh, mentioned that wages have been going up recently, but um, for decades, wages have been stagnant as the cost of living has gone up on basics, food, gas, housing, you add to that the cost of an education, child care, uh, health insurance, my goodness, so many out-of-pocket costs. You have more than half of Americans living paycheck to paycheck. This is not new news, but inflation is making this even more of a detriment to the American uh, consumer. And so this is not a narrative of you know Americans not being able to you know take control of their spending. This is a, uh, a derivative of a country that is not prioritizing enough the needs of everyday Americans financial needs. We look at, for example, uh, the federal minimum wage, still $7.25 per hour. Let that sink in, right? Uh, against uh, a, a country that uh, we have in runaway inflation at this point. And you know, while it's good to see that the jobs numbers are holding up, uh, that means that interest rates are only going to get higher as the Fed tries to crack down on, uh, on this higher cost of living to bring down demand. And so this is going to get harder, uh, more harder Harder than it gets easier. And, and we have a, a long road ahead, unfortunately. Farnoosh, I'm, I'm going to ask my director, Brett Holy, to put that graphic up again about the, the, the credit spending and where we're at right now. I know you keep saying this is not a new story, but it, it is alarming when you look at the trend because you're looking at the, at, at the rate of where everything's going. And you're right. The credit spending was getting higher and higher. It came down a little bit during the pandemic, right? It drops down because people are at home. They're not spending as much. But then it sort of rockets away. On top of that, Farnoosh, I know you know this, anytime that we try to buy something nowadays, you have these buy now, pay later services. So I'm just wondering, are the credit card companies extending too much credit? And is the American consumer using these options of buy now, pay later, which any financial expert will tell you there's good debt and bad debt, this is bad debt. Is that affecting the American consumer to a point that it's bankrupting them? Listen, we live in a capitalist country and financial services companies are incentivized to create a frictionless transaction for us. You know, the, using credit cards inherently, uh, it's too easy. It's, it's very um, easy to overspend. Studies have proven time and time again that using cash versus credit cards, you're going to overspend on the credit cards. That's guaranteed. And then you've got on top of that new instruments like buy now, pay later loans. And by the way, it's a loan, right? It's not a program. It's not a plan. It's a loan. And it's adding to the debt crisis. It's making borrowing very, very easy. There's no credit check, right? So you don't even need to have a credit score to qualify for a BNPL plan. And, and they get you right when you're really eager to buy at the shopping cart, at the transaction where you're about to click buy online. And a lot of times, even if you're in the store and you're swiping your credit card, credit card, some of them, credit cards, or some of them are getting into the business of offering you a buy now, pay later solution to that sweater or that TV that you're about to buy. And so um, they're getting us where they know we're really vulnerable. And trust me, this is not unconscious. This is deliberate. Uh, financial buy now pay later is a billion dollar industry and it's only growing apple is getting into this game so i think that there is a moral hazard here we have to have um more of a crackdown more of a, an oversight uh, across all credit products and by the way the consumer financial protection bureau is looking very closely at bnpl services because uh, this is at this point not as regulated as credit card companies and that's problematic
Okay, Farnoosh Tarabi, we thank you so much for joining Top Story tonight. You explained it perfectly so we can understand. We really do appreciate that. Okay, we want to head on now. Another concern Americans are facing a potential pilot strike this holiday season. Pilots from some of the America's biggest airlines are pushing for better pay and benefits after years of staff shortages. Thousands even threatening to walk off the job as that busy holiday travel season gets underway. Stephen Romo reports. Tonight, your holiday travel could be approaching some turbulence. Nearly 15,000 Delta Airlines pilots voted to authorize a strike in order to secure a new contract with the nation's second largest carrier. They carried our passengers safely to their destination day in and day out throughout the pandemic. It's past time for Delta to reward the pilots with a hard-earned contract that they've earned. The move coming as pilots at the country's two other biggest airlines, American and United, also voted to reject new contracts. Travelers now reacting to that news. It would be concerning, yeah. It's important for the people who are doing the work to be happy with what they're doing, and that comes with compensation. Delta pilots are negotiating pay and benefits that were last settled in 2016. The ball is in, in the company's courts, and the Delta pilots are willing to go the distance. Delta saying in a statement that they are confident that the parties will reach an agreement that is fair and equitable. American Airlines pilots rejected a proposal calling for a 12% raise for pilots, while United pilots turned down roughly a 15% pay bump, according to the Allied Pilots Association. American did not return NBC's request for comment. A spokesperson for United telling NBC News their outcome was expected, but they are working on a new agreement. Airline industry employment plummeted in 2020 during the pandemic, and while the number has rebounded, there were still 17% fewer active commercial pilot certificates in 2021 compared to 2009. The labor shortage has led to headaches for travelers due to delays. Something passengers hope they won't have to deal with this busy holiday season. I don't know, I don't travel very much, but I am planning to travel for Christmas <laughs> with my kids. So I don't know. I think family is so important. Hopefully they can work everything out. Okay, Stephen joins us now. So, Stephen, is this potential strike imminent or could it be a while? And I guess the bigger question is, will this affect Thanksgiving travel? Yeah, it's a question so many people have, Tom. Well, before a strike would actually happen, a government agency called the National Mediation Board would have to say basically there are no other solutions. Then there's a 30-day cooling off period, and following that, the strike could happen. So that will put it at least past Thanksgiving, given that it's at least a month away. But if it could happen before Christmas, that is still up in the air. Tom? Yeah, that would be a problem. Okay, Stephen, thank you for that. We want to turn now to politics. With just six days away from the midterms, President Biden and giving a major campaign speech tonight, his push to voters as Republicans gain momentum in the polls. Peter Alexander is in the key battleground state of Georgia tonight. With polls showing neck and neck Senate races, Democrats are calling in reinforcements to key battlegrounds. Former President Obama in Nevada to help vulnerable Democratic Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. Consider the fact that democracy is on the ballot. It's an argument President Biden will hammer home in a speech later tonight. But Republicans like Masto's opponent Adam Laxalt are focusing on the economy and rising crime. Now, of course, she's doing her, her election year turnaround and trying to pretend that she supports the police. But I can tell you, when you talk to cops in Nevada, they're not buying it. Another competitive Senate race, Ohio. Democrat Tim Ryan on defense over inflation. A voter asking, is green energy spending in what Democrats dub the Inflation Reduction Act actually lowering prices? In the short term, no. I think when it comes to inflation, we need a tax cut. We need to put money in people's pockets. Republican J.D. Vance, who questioned the 2020 results, was pressed if he'll accept the outcome next week. If things don't go the way that I expect, I'll support uh, the guy who wins. Then there's the tight race here in Georgia. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock facing Republican Herschel Walker. Democrat Nicole Davis, the owner of a printing business and mother of three, telling us she's backing Warnock. In your eyes, what's on the ballot next week? On the ballot, to be honest, my family, my future, um, my business. She benefited from President Biden's student loan forgiveness and trusts Democrats on abortion rights. I've had friends who have been put in those situations. I can't imagine if they did not have the choice. We first met fifth-generation farmer Drew Eccles during President Biden's first months in office, a Republican who told us back then he was impressed with the president. 
I think Biden's doing a lot of positive things. He's, you know, people have confidence. But he's not giving President Biden high marks anymore. Are you still satisfied? No, I'm not very satisfied. He told us he's voting for Walker. What's your biggest frustration right now? My biggest frustration right this second is the fact that it's costing me more to live day to day. It's also costing me more to run my business day to day. Everybody's hurting right now. We're taking it on the chin. All right, Peter joins us now from College Park, just outside of Atlanta. So, Peter, you're out there talking to voters in key battleground states. Today, we had another interest rate hike. Is inflation and the economy dominating those conversations? Well, inflation is definitely top of mind for many of the voters that we've spoken to here, Tom, obviously having an impact on gas prices and on groceries, everything that the folks we saw are paying for these days. But Democrats and Republicans have different views on it. Republicans saying it's the Republic, it's the Democrats failed policies to blame. The Democrats I spoke to say all of this is going to take time. And of course, the U.S. is coming out of a pandemic, Tom. And there in Georgia, an interesting thing's happening. I know with early voting, there were some real concerns early on from President Biden and other Democrats that new voting regulations would, would hinder people from voting. But the exact opposite is happening in Georgia? Well, at least in Georgia right now, Tom, we are seeing record early voting right now. More than two million Georgians have already cast their vote. But notably, among those youngest voters in this state, between the ages of 18 and 24, just 8% of them of cast a ballot so far. Tom? 8%. All right. So far, younger voter turnout there in Georgia, not great. And like Peter mentioned, the economy, a major concern for voters. Now it's proving to be the issue white suburban women are focused on. Take a look at this new Wall Street Journal poll showing that group drastically shifting their support from Democrats to Republicans in the last two months, citing economic concerns. This is a huge SOS for Democrats right now. For more insight, I want to bring in NBC News contributor Sarah Fagan. She's also a former George W. Bush senior aide and White House political director. Sarah, so great to see you here on Top Story. Thanks for coming on. I do want to ask you about that poll. If you could put that graphic up once again, Brett, I'm going to ask you to do that. Uh, you worked in the White House. You've worked with data like this. This is so surprising to me because the, the suburban white women showed up for Joe Biden on Election Day back in 2020. And now it, it just seems like they're abandoning the party. And this is just going back to August 2022. What do you think about this poll? Mm -hmm. Well, I think in some respects, it's not that surprising. If you think about the top issues of the day, inflation, rising gas prices, the cost of living, real wage growth going down, uh, women uh, are twice as likely as men to manage their family's budget. So, so these suburban women are in the front lines of trying to figure out how to make these budgets work. And so these economic issues have become very top of mind. And with Democrats controlling all levers of power in Washington, uh, they're going to take the brunt of the blame for this. You know, when Roe versus Wade was overturned, women came out. Mm -hmm. it, it was clear people were upset across the country. Um, and Democrats mm -hmm. thought they could seize on this. And, and for a while there, it looked like it, it possibly could help them in the midterms. But this new poll, and when they were talking to these, these suburban white women, mm -hmm. what they found, too, is that Women haven't forgotten about what happened with abortion, but they're just so laser focused on the economy right now. That, that's exactly right. And for, for the reasons I outlined, you know, they're the ones trying to pinch pennies and make it all work. And with respect to abortion, look, I, I, I think that this is a real issue for this group of women, but it's just not the most important issue. And and if inflation was four percent or three percent, it might be a different story. But that's not where we are today. The other reason I don't know that the abortion issue, issue is so uh, dominant in this election is because it's it's relatively new. And while certainly there are many states that had trigger laws and there are some states that have had real changes uh, to the uh, accessibility of abortion, for most people, really nothing has changed. And even in those trigger law states, they're really tied up in the courts right now. So for suburban women, this is just, A, not a top-of-mind issue personally, day-to-day -to, -day to them, but B, uh, when they really stop and look at their states, really the state law has not actually been upended in most cases. Have so, Democrats— uh, they're Sarah, really focused on these economic issues, yeah. Do you think Democrats have now—we we have six days to go—have they run out of time? Uh, we have the president out campaigning across the country talking about the economy right now. It, 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 has that has that ship left? I mean, is there any time to win these voters back, or do you think it, it's going to be just very painful, a painful night for Democrats on, come come election day? 
Well, I think the die was cast a long time ago, Tom. I, you know, if you even go back to sort of last year and the fight over the Build Back Better and the $4 trillion of spending, a lot of these kind of impressions were cast then. Uh, there have been issues that have popped up, certainly Roe v. Wade, one of them that caught attention for a moment. But uh, really, these voters have been focused on the economy for quite some time. And with Democrats, um, you know, certainly controlling both chambers, uh, that's been the issue. It would take something very dramatic on the world stage, I think, to, to change uh, the course of this coming election where Republicans are expected to certainly win the House and I think probably win the Senate as well. OK, Sarah Fagan for us tonight here on Top Story. Sarah, we appreciate it. We have new details tonight on that brutal hammer attack on Paul Pelosi. New court documents revealing the suspect knew he would get caught. But we're also learning more about a security guard who was allegedly near the Pelosi home at the time of that attack. NBC's Miguel Almaguer is in San Francisco with the latest. As a hammer-wielding David DePap smashed his way inside the Pelosi home, investigators say he told them he knew this was a suicide mission. Despite clear security, new court documents reveal DePap knew that the ring cameras outside the house captured his entry, but defendant remained undeterred. The suspect was inside the home, alone with Paul Pelosi, for nearly 30 minutes, arriving at approximately 2 a.m. The complaint says a private security guard working near the Pelosi home the night of the attack saw a man in the area with a large bag. Even after hearing banging, though, the security guard never called police. With the Speaker of the House often the target of violent death threats, NBC News has confirmed Capitol Police in Washington, D.C. have the ability to monitor Pelosi's San Francisco home 24 hours a day. But during the attack, no one was watching the feed. The Washington Post reporting, after seeing flashing lights, officers rewound the footage and could see the intruder break in. In court, DePap, a Canadian national pleading not guilty, but authorities say he admitted to crimes. It's clear from his own statements uh, what his intentions were. After the attack, DePap told officers he had other plans. Defendant named several targets, including a local professor, several prominent state and federal politicians, and relatives of those politicians. Tonight, authorities painting the picture of a madman who easily broke into the home of the Speaker of the House. The suspect's next court hearing will be later this week. If convicted on state charges alone, he faces life in prison. Tom? Okay, Miguel, thank you. Now to a teenage girl who was robbed at gunpoint while working at a McDonald's in New Orleans. When she called 911, the voice on the other end of the line was her mother. NBC's Nyella Charles has the story. 911, what's the location of the emergency? A robber stormed into a New Orleans McDonald's and held the employees at gunpoint, forcing them into the freezer. Mama, can you please send a police officer right now to McDonald's? While the assailant forced the manager to open the safe, 16-year-old Tania Hill frantically called 911. What's the address? What's the address? She recognized the voice on the other end almost immediately. It was her biggest protector, her mom. Mama, please hurry up. She got a gun. Hill's mother, Terry Clark, a 911 dispatch assistant manager, happened to be working overtime that night. The mother and daughter speaking exclusively to our affiliate WDSU. She said McDonald's, so I'm saying, what is your location at McDonald's? It's me, Tania, on Cleveland. Mama, help. At my job, Mama. I still need the address. A stroke of luck in a scary situation. She got us in the freezer, Mama. You in the freezer? Yes, she has us in the freezer. Okay, we sending somebody out, okay? WDSU also obtained surveillance footage of the incident, along with audio of the 911 call through a public records request. While I was taking the call, tears coming down my face, but I'm still trying to do my job. And I did my job to the best of my ability. She got our manager with her mama. Please come on, hurry up, please, mama. Oh, baby, I am. I'm going to send somebody. I have to ask you these questions. If I could clone Terry, I would. And I just remind everybody that there are people under the headset that have feelings, that have emotion, and we are committed to your safety, believe it or not, 365 days of the year, even when it's our own child. According to city data in New Orleans, armed robberies are up 44% this year over last and higher than pre-pandemic. Police say the suspect ran off with the money. No one was injured, making Hill feel even more lucky to be alive. I didn't want my mama to have to bury her youngest child. So, like, 
knowing that I could have lost my life, but she saved my life. <laughs> oh, I got lipstick on me. Okay, Nyla Charles joins us now from Los Angeles. A great ending there. Nyla, the daughter instantly recognized her mother's voice when she made that call. We heard that in your report there, but it, it sounds like as soon as she, she called 911, she knew she was talking to her mother. Right, Tom, based on the 911 audio, it seems like it, right? If you hear it, you can hear the, sh don't hear the shock in her voice, just the comfort when she says mama. And for good reason, because her mother rushed over to the McDonald's right after that call to make sure her daughter was okay. The next day, she went back to work even. Tom? Okay, Nyla Charles for us. Nyla, thank you for that. Next tonight to the big break in the fight against auto part thefts. Federal authorities in multiple states making arrests in a catalytic converter theft ring. You can see what a converter theft looks like here. The process takes just a few minutes, but leaves drivers with hundreds in repair bills. Ken Delanian has this report. Tonight, the nationwide crackdown on this growing epidemic of car part thefts in what officials are calling a half a billion dollar criminal enterprise. They're blatant. They'll just wall in here. They'll look up the camera. They'll have a mask on and walk right by. They don't really seem to care. They can roll underneath one, 30 seconds, roll back out, and leave. This surveillance video showing thieves stealing nine catalytic converters from school buses in New Jersey. At this RV storage facility near Dallas, they moved with breathtaking efficiency. I guess they look at it as a shopping mall of catalytic converters. The converters are embedded in the exhaust systems of most cars and trucks, making auto emissions less harmful. They contain precious metals, including rhodium, palladium, and platinum, whose value has skyrocketed in recent years. Some of the metals are $26,000 an ounce. Um, so you can see why, you know, um, it's very expensive uh, repair to make, number one, but number two, why it's such a common crime. Federal authorities raiding this auto parts shop in New Jersey, arresting 21 people in all across eight states. The defendants charged today are accused of buying the stolen converters, where they go for $1,000 on the black market. One of the accused, Navin Khanna, posted a photo of a catalytic converter necklace with a winking face emoji on social media. Authorities raided his $1.7 million New Jersey home. He could not be reached for comment today. In Oklahoma, multiple law enforcement agencies raided a Tulsa facility where they found them stacked in piles. The National Insurance Crime Bureau says 12 times as many catalytic converters were stolen in 2021 compared to 2019. The crime wave turning tragic last April. Houston Deputy Sheriff Darren Almendarez was shot and killed when he tried to stop thieves from stealing his converter. You know, we're tired of this crime in our community. We're tired that people aren't even safe to go out to the grocery store. This is a cop. This is a cop that's just out with his family. It could be any one of us. The defendants in today's arrest are charged with various offenses, including transporting stolen property and money laundering. They face decades in prison. FBI Director Christopher Wray said in a statement tonight that these defendants stole hundreds of millions of dollars from thousands of innocent car owners. Meanwhile, if you're wondering how to tell whether your catalytic converter has been removed, you won't see it, but you will hear it as soon as you start the vehicle. The engine should emit a loud roar, almost as if there was a hole in the muffler. Tom? Okay, great tip for us. Ken, thank you. Still ahead tonight, the new details on the deadly shooting of rapper Takeoff. We told you about this last night. What an autopsy just revealed about his cause of death as police hunt for the killer. Plus, the massive deal reached by CVS and Walgreens to settle thousands of opioid lawsuits. How much the two retailers will have to pay up. And finding JoJo, a six-year-old from Miami, found in Canada months after he was allegedly kidnapped by his own father. The moment he was finally reunited with his mother and how a complete stranger helped get him home. Stay with us. All right, we're back now with an emotional reunion, months in the making. A six-year-old from Florida missing for months after a visitation with his father. But this weekend, he was found more than 2,000 miles away, largely thanks to a complete stranger. NBC Sam Brock has the details. Tonight, the reunion ending one Florida mother's worst nightmare. Yannick Concepcion hugging her son Jojo for the first time in months. I'm sorry, I can't stop crying. I'm so happy. <laughs> the six-year-old, who's autistic, missing from Miami-Dade County since August after police say his father and paternal grandmother failed to return him after a custodial visit. Everything was gone. 
from his apartment. Everything was gone. His phones were off. Just days after JoJo's disappearance, a private investigator tracking down this surveillance video of JoJo and his father at a Walmart in Maine and later discovering the trio had crossed the border. We felt that uh, we knew they were, we, that they were in Canada. That was based on some dogs that were used in the private sector. And then we started uh, putting together the information. The FBI offering a $10,000 reward last month and then finally a break in the case. Last Sunday, JoJo and his father spotted at a Walmart 2,000 miles away in New Brunswick, Canada. When I watched them, it was, it was like people were oblivious, and I knew what I had to do, and I knew what I wanted to do. The tipster, who wants to remain anonymous, telling NBC South Florida she recognized the pair from the local news and immediately called police. I did it as a mother. I did it because I can't not imagine never seeing my son again. Law enforcement saying Jorge and Lillian Morales were arrested shortly after, and JoJo pictured here flying back to Miami. Yana now forever grateful to that eagle-eyed stranger. We're both crying, and, and I told her, thank you for saving my son's life, and she said, the only thing I want it's if you could update me and send me a picture on a holiday here, and then I was like, of course, I will bring you here so we can meet you. But for now, the mother and son just making up for lost time. We're gonna recreate Halloween and we're gonna recreate my birthday, which we miss both, so we're gonna do that. Tonight, Jorge and Lillian Morales are in custody in Canada. Authorities tell us they will be extradited back to Miami, but at this point, no time frame as to when. Tom, back to you. All right, Sam Brock for us, and we also want to thank our NBC South Florida affiliate for their help with that story. When we come back, the former heavyweight boxer arrested the charges he's now facing in connection to one of the largest cocaine busts in U.S. history. We'll tell you how much exactly. Stay with us. All right, we're back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with new details in the deadly shooting of rapper Takeoff. According to an autopsy, the 28-year-old died from gunshot wounds to the head and the torso. The rapper, who was part of the group Migos, was shot during a private party at a Houston bowling alley on Monday. Police are asking for the public's help in finding his killer. Now to the multi-billion dollar opioid settlement involving two of the nation's largest pharmaceutical chains. CVS and Walgreens say they have reached a tentative deal to pay about $5 billion each to settle thousands of lawsuits for their alleged role in the opioid crisis. The deal needs to be agreed on by local, state, and tribal governments. And former heavyweight boxer, a former heavyweight boxer has been charged with trafficking more than $1 billion worth of cocaine through U.S. ports. Goran Gojic is accused of helping transport drugs from Colombia to Europe on cargo ships loaded in the U.S. In one case, nearly 20 tons of cocaine was seized from a ship at a port in Philadelphia. It's still one of the largest cocaine seizures in U.S. history. Okay, we turn now to the tragedy in Uvalde, Texas. The new interim superintendent of schools spoke with our Morgan Chesky about security improvements and getting back the community's trust. High security all over, very visible security. For Gary Patterson, it's day two. If you see down here, you've got another trooper visible on the east side. And if you were to walk around, you'd see two more. And we're talking every campus every in the campus, Valley. Every campus. Multiple has. troopers. His job split between changes you can see and healing the pain you can't. This is the worst nightmare uh, that you could possibly have. The veteran educator who volunteered for the job stresses a security overhaul is already underway. Fencing's going up. There'll be security gates. There'll be cameras at the vestibule, single entrance. You'll have to be buzzed in. We're working on electronic card swipe. And especially critical with the district's entire police force suspended, rebuilding trust. What do you tell a parent who tells you that they don't trust law enforcement anymore? to protect their kid. I think that's where we are right now. There's a lack of trust in, in each organization that responded. Trust compromised with every new video from May 24th, further confirming the fatal disconnect between officers and the young victims trapped inside. When you hear the director of DPS say that despite everything that's happened, that agency has not failed this community, what do you say to that? I say it's discouraging. Do you see a day when things start getting better? I hope so. I don't know when that is. It's, it's not today or tomorrow. This is a strong school district and a strong community, and I think we will. 
come together and we can make progress. Morgan Chesky, NBC News, Uvalde. Okay, now to top stories, Global Watch. North Korea firing 23 ballistic missiles into the waters off the Korean peninsula. At least one of those missiles causing residents on an island off South Korea to evacuate from their homes. South Korea says it's the highest number of short-range missiles launched by the North in a single day. South Korea launched three air-to-ground missiles in response. And five lions escaping their enclosure at a zoo in Sydney, Australia. Officials say the lions managed to get out because of a problem with one of the enclosure's fences. The zoo going into lockdown mode and several overnight guests woken up and rushed to safety. Four of the lions returned to the enclosure on their own, but one did have to be tranquilized. Luckily, no employees or guests were hurt. Okay, coming up next, the trend rippling through workplaces across the country. New data showing employee productivity has plummeted since the pandemic. So what is driving that drop? We'll put that question to a panel of experts next. Which brings us to our next segment, a closer look at a headline that grabbed our attention here at Top Story. Worker productivity hitting an all-time low in America. And with a number of contributing factors, we have an all-star panel tonight to help us get a better understanding of why this is happening. Joining me now is NPR's global economic correspondent, Stacey Vanek-Smith, Julia Coronado, president of Macro Policy Perspectives and a professor at UT Austin, and psychotherapist and author Robbie Ludwig. Ladies, thank you all for joining Top Stories, and I really do appreciate it. Stacey, I'm going to start with you. Talk to me about the stat from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and why this sort of sent all those headlines in a fury across America. What did they actually find? Well, productivity, which is a measure of how much companies get out of each hour we work, has fallen at the fastest rate on record since they started keeping track in the 40s. Which is weird because it picked up right when the pandemic started, right? Absolutely, and it had been, it sort of stagnant and falling for a little while, so economists thought, this is our moment. Like, this is the moment when productivity is gonna pick up, and that's not what happened. And Julia, what, what kind of impact is this happening on, having on businesses, and why do you think this is happening? Well, one major contributing factor is we're seeing record amounts of job transitions, people changing jobs at a record pace. And when you're new at a job, uh, you tend to be less productive. It takes you time to ramp up and train into full productivity in any position. So we hear that in company earnings reports. They talk about uh, the cost of training and recruiting and filling open positions. And so it could be just a friction that's tied to the recovery from the pandemic and people uh, changing jobs to maybe jobs that they will ultimately be more productive at down the road is just take, going to take some time. We hope so. And, and Stacy, there's also this phenomenon happening called quiet quitting. What exactly is quiet mm -hmm. quitting? Quiet quitting is uh, basically when you are still technically in your job, you're just maybe not doing your job. Uh, or you're doing it at a very, very low level, lowest common denominator. Okay, so Robbie, I have to come to you with this now. Yeah. So what is going on? When we decided to do this panel, one of our producers suggested that we talk to someone like you because mm -hmm. they mentioned that it's been tough for the American worker over the last three years, and it has been. Yeah. Pandemics, a lot of whiplash, come to work, go back home, work from home. That's gotta be tough on people. Yeah, and I think the values changed over the pandemic. We realized how how important it was to have work-life balance and asked ourselves, does our job really love us back? And, and the answer is no, there isn't the same kind of loyalty that once was towards workers. So workers are not feeling as loyal to companies either. And they feel increased stress. And, and the anecdote to that almost is quite quitting, setting boundaries so that you don't feel burnt out and exhausted and detached from what you're doing. And you were telling me you're helping people who are very blunt with you. They say, I just don't want to work anymore. Yeah, yeah. And that's young people, people that aren't at the end of their careers? No, these are not people who want to retire. They're just done. They feel done with corporate life. They don't feel that like they're getting paid enough. And in some cases, they feel isolated because there isn't that opportunity to work in the office and meet people and socialize. Yeah, I was gonna tell you, Julia, you, in America, you can't just be done, right? In America, you can't be done. This is capitalism. You, you sort of almost have to work. So what do you think happens? What do employers start to do? And I know we're entering a recession, and, and possibly entering a recession, and things are slowly changing. Yeah, so it is true that um, we hear in surveys and we hear it in company reports that people are choosing jobs not just based on salary, 
but based on the whole package, how their employers treat them, work-life balance, and work-from-home arrangements. And different people have different preferences. So companies are competing for workers on a much wider range of dimensions of compensation uh, than just pay itself. And Stacey, um, we yeah. are seeing the labor market cool off, and that might mean uh, more people need to work and have less bargaining power, but we've been in a very hot job market. And, and Stacey, how do workers get, uh, how are they monitored? How are employers monitoring their staff to know whether they are producing or they're not producing? Well, it's created a very kind of interesting system. Some people are calling it productivity paranoia. Um, a lot of workers are, tr a lot of workplaces are tracking their workers more than they used to with software and other things, especially workers who are working from home where it can be kind of harder to keep track of people. And a lot of jobs don't have, you know, a, aren't so quantifiable. So they can be a little hard to know how hard someone is working. And I think there is a lot of paranoia about that. And workers are kind of fighting back with yeah. in various ways. And, and Robbie, what, what's your advice to people when they tell you, listen, I don't want to work anymore. I'm not happy in my, my mm -hmm. employment. What, what do you tell them? Well, you have to think about what do you want to get out of the workplace? And maybe you can get it in the workplace. Maybe you get it from a hobby. But to ask yourself, what does it mean to have a happy life and a productive life? And to go to your employer, ask for what you want. Yeah. And for employees, for, for people who are CEOs, care about the worker and their happiness. That will add to loyalty and productivity. Julia, real quick, and this will be the final question, I want to ask you, how will employers ultimately, I don't want to say force, but try to get the most productivity out of their workers as possible? Well, forcing is exactly what you shouldn't do. I think that um, employers do need to adjust to a new reality where people value a wider range of things and, and learn how to meet them there. And some companies are. In fact, this is going to be the definer of winners and losers more going forward, that companies who sort of take the labor market where it is, take the workers where they are, and figure out how to optimize in this new world are going to be the ones that hold on to workers and gain market share in their industries. Okay, we're going to have to wait and see. Julia Coronado, Robbie Ludwig, and Stacey Vanek-Smith, thank you so much for joining Top Story tonight. I really do appreciate it. All right, coming up, Mind Your Manners. It's been 100 years since Emily Post wrote the book on etiquette, and her great-great-granddaughter joins Top Story tonight to give an update on what's still in and what's out. So how do your manners measure up? That's next. And whether you're a royalty or a regular person, in what often seems like the age of incivility, manners do still matter. Stephanie Goss tells us the family who wrote the book on etiquette is out with a very proper update. When the first edition of Emily Post's Etiquette was published in 1922, how do you do was the proper greeting. There were instructions on when to bow, ladies go first, and how to sit, don't sprawl at length. An entire chapter was dedicated to the debutante. Now, 100 years later, there have been some changes. We paint a picture of etiquette where it's not about elitism and exclusivity. Emily Post's centennial edition is out, written by her great-great-grandchildren, Daniel and Lizzie. When you look around, where do we need the most help? <laughs> <laughs> Communication is definitely a place that we need the most help. We really talk about thinking about our language and does it serve us well? How does it impact the people around us? That sounds a lot like a focus on civility. Very much so. At a time when civility is greatly needed, from the sports fields to the halls of government. Using consideration, respect, and honesty to guide our interactions as we move through the world. But this edition of the Manners Handbook isn't totally unrecognizable. Most importantly, what are you going to do when I invite you over for dinner and the fork is on the right? <laughs> I'm not going to worry about it. How awful would it be if I showed up to your house and was like, oh, you set that table wrong. But the fork does still belong on the left. <laughs> I will probably still use my fork in my left hand. And I will make sure to chew with my mouth shut. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. We thank Stephanie Goss for that, and we love this story so much. So for more on the updated roadmap for modern manners, we're joined by Lizzie Post, the author of Emily Post's Etiquette Centennial Edition and great-great-granddaughter of Emily Post. We just heard from her there in Stephanie's piece. So Lizzie, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. What were the biggest updates in your edition from your great-great-grandmother's book? 
Well, thank you so much for having me. Some of the biggest updates were around things having to do with, um, I would say, introductions and uh, and greetings, um, even just slight mentions of things like uh, when we are social distancing, a handshake might not be the most appropriate greeting. Uh, so really use your words and your warmth to convey a, a great greeting if we're in that type of circumstance. That was definitely something I'd never written about before. Um, but also the subject of pronouns and getting people's pronouns right, especially when it comes to introductions. Um, that and, and making sure that we have names correct, that's another really big one. That's always been a consistent point of etiquette, but it's a really important piece in um, identity and the etiquette around identity these days. We all want to be respectful and considerate as best we can and respect someone's identity and who they say they are is, I think, probably one of the biggest fundamentals in that in that area. Lizzie, why do you think we, we so many of us have, have lost our manners, lost our concepts of politeness, lost our concepts of just, you know, decency, I would say? I would say that a couple different things. One, stress leads to more rudeness, which often leads to more stress. And let's face it, we have had a very stressful few years here. I mean, just across the globe, it's been stressful and chaotic. So I do think that uh, uh, collectively, we are all sort of feeling the angst. Um, and it does, it, it makes moments, I think, um, that can be frustrating that we might otherwise let slide, things that we don't let slide. I feel that people tend to be a little more ready to fight out there in the public world than they used to be. And I think that things like etiquette and thinking about our own behavior, being self-reflective, being aware of others are very um, good ways, good tools that we can use to help combat that sense of stress and frustration and angst that we have so that we can be the people that we really want to be and bring our best selves to our communities. What's the rudest behavior you witness on a daily basis? I, I actually feel like people giving into that, that moment, that stressful moment, is probably the thing I see more often than not. I, I won't lie, I'm really fortunate. In my town, I seem to run into a lot of really nice people. Um, but I do think that the, the small things can make a really, really big difference. Um, saying please and thank you, acknowledging people. Uh, when we did the research for the book, I interviewed the teenager who works at the convenience store a block away from my house. I said, what, what do you want from people? What do you see on a daily basis? He says, people don't say goodbye. They might say hello, but they never acknowledge the goodbye and the leaving. And this is a teenager asking for simple, basic etiquette in the world. Um, I think there's, there's a lot we can do to, to help facilitate getting it out there, despite the, the nastiness that we can come across from time to time. And what's one easy change viewers at home could make today to improve their manners, you think? This might sound a, a little kindergarten, but going back to your magic words, please, thank you, you're welcome, I'm sorry, excuse me. These words can be really transformative, especially when we start using them, I would say even in our own homes. Sometimes those places of comfort are the places where we let our manners relax the most. It can be really transformative to see what they can do when you start engaging these very simple acts of kindness, these words that make such a difference to our interactions. Lizzie Post, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight and reminding us of just those small things you can do to both make your friend's life better, strangers' lives better, your life better. We really do appreciate it. Thanks. And we thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. There's more news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.